The Xu Chang Saga by user Hume Reddit The Ox's Plan, Part 4 Xu scrambled to get away from the big hunter. Her broken arm and tortured gut screamed at her, but she had to move, had to get away. The bridge doors were just a few paces away, but she could hear the hunter chasing her, bringing along the grenade she'd rammed down its throat. And it was way too close. Pain. Never in her life had Shu experienced such agony. Her midsection, her arm, mere drops in a sea. Her head felt as if it was exploding. Her body seized around her, every muscle deciding to act on its own. She barely felt the impact of the deck as she fell over mid-stride and slid. Her fractured arms screamed as her own strength pulled at it, and her teeth ground against each other. She tasted blood. When the seizure was done, she lay on the deck, twitching as bloody drool dripped from her lips. Sound came to her ears as though from far away, and her eyes felt glued shut. A roaring filled her ears, like the ocean surf on Vancouver's shores. She liked the beach. Was it summer yet? It felt warm. Could Daddy take her swimming? She was supposed to be doing something important, but she couldn't remember what it was. Her entire body hurt. She was so tired. Was she sick? Mother would always bring her oatmeal when she was in bed sick laced with brown sugar and little bits of apple. No matter how naggy she was the rest of the time, when her children were sick, she put it all aside. mama. She wanted to sleep, but a persistent beeping was cutting through the noise in her mind. An alarm clock? No, it had to do with the important things she was supposed to be doing, didn't it? It didn't matter. If she wanted to sleep, she had to do something about it. It hurt to open her eyes. The world swam around her and she felt like she was going to barf. She briefly forgot that her arm was broken and cried out as she put weight on it, but the shot of pain cleared away some of the fog in her mind. She realized she was still on the bridge of the hunter ship, the self-destruct. The ship is going to explode. It crossed her mind to let it happen. Just lay down, go to sleep, never wake back up. So many problems solved all at once. The Dominion would be happy. Myun wouldn't. Ima wouldn't. Shu struggled to stand nearly falling over several times. The deck rocked treacherously underneath her feet. The beeping seemed to surge and fade. Her vision was still watery, so she let the sound guide her in the right direction. She nearly tripped over the dead hunter leader. The beeping was climbing in pitch. That was probably bad. She could see blurry symbols changing on the panel, probably counting down in whatever weird language it used. The panel was roughly at the level of her chest. Aya, she hated being short. She reached out with her bleeding arm, grasping at buttons, trying to figure out which would turn the self-destruct off, if it could be turned off at all. She had no idea which control was the right one, so she started randomly slapping at anything in reach. Her head hurt and her vision was getting worse. Blackness was creeping in along the edges. Finally, she hit a button that caused the countdown symbols to stop changing. Good enough. She was satisfied. Shu let the darkness take her. Rigari stormed through the corridors of the rich plains on his way to the bridge. His left arm hung limply at his side. He hadn't been hit directly by the pulse blast, but the nimbus was enough to shatter his elbow. He'd find out later if it could be repaired or if he was looking at a replacement. Right now, he had things to take care of. The pain wasn't useful, so he ignored it, gripping his rifle tightly in his good hand. The broad doors leading to the bridge parted before him. Like everything else, the bridge was scaled for Governor Agavendragon, so Rigari wouldn't have been surprised if the bridge crew, mostly Rikatupcha, sometimes indulged in outdoor sports in the vast area. On the forward screen, the hunter assault ship was visible, a menacing but oddly idle thing hanging in space. The captain turned at the Gowan's entrance. Officer Rigari, what is the status of... Why have we not docked with the hunter ship? Rigari interrupted. He gestured at the screen with his pulse rifle. Sister Shu is still aboard, and the fact that the hunters haven't resumed their assault means she still has them occupied. We must take the initiative. What? said, horrified. You want me to dock to a hunter ship? Voluntarily? Yes, Rigari said flatly. But, by all means, he brought up the pulse rifle in his good arm. Consider, involuntarily, an option. Ima wet the cloth in her paw and gently cleaned the blood from Shu's face. When the team returned from braving the innards of the hunter raiding ship, a team mostly made up of Gowans, she thought proudly, it was bearing Shu's inert form, requiring all of them to lift. 
At first, she didn't know where the keening was coming from. Then Regari had looked at her, and she realized the sound was coming from herself. She's alive, Mother Ima, he'd said. His arm hung loosely at his side, and he wasn't able to help carry the injured human, but he demanded the right to go along and offer his rifle. But we must get her to the medical bay quickly. They hurried toward the medical center, and Ima dashed ahead to find a hover cart and bring it to them. Once Shu was laid out on the cart, they could move much faster, and it was easier to see Shu's injuries, which made it so much worse. Crimson blood leaked from the human's nose, mouth, and even her eyes, and it was horrible to see. She gently held Shu's hand, running alongside the hover cart until they entered the medical bay. Then she found herself roughly pushed aside. Get out of the way, demanded Trog, the shipboard doctor. Ima almost slashed at him with her claws, but Regari caught her before she could do anything rash. Come, Mother Ima, we can watch from out of the way, he said, gently ushering her to the side, near the wall where he'd propped his pulse rifle. The Cortai's black, bottomless eyes cast over the Gowan officer. You require attention, Officer Regari. One of my assistants will treat you. I will wait for you to become available. Don't be ridiculous. The human will occupy my efforts. I will wait, doctor, Regari replied. His ears were flicked forward nonchalantly, but his teeth bared briefly, and his good paw rested on the butt of his rifle. Only the best for me. Trog snorted. Very well, but if your stubbornness costs you your arm, don't complain to me later. Then the Cortai was gesturing impatiently at his assistants, under the watchful and slightly hostile gaze of the two Gowans. Time lost meaning as they watched the Cortai and his team work on Shu. Words were tossed around that Ima didn't like the sound of, cerebral hemorrhaging, internal bleeding, and bone fracture. But the steady confidence of Trog was comforting, even if she didn't much care for his species. Eventually, the Cortai put away his instruments and dismissed the others, sending them off to deal with the other, less pressing injuries that had been suffered among the crew. Tra pushed Shu's bed over himself, where the hovering platform automatically connected to the display on the wall, showing the unconscious human's vitals on the holographic panel. The Cortai turned to the pair of Gowans. Now, Officer Regari, shall we see if your stubbornness has resulted in permanent nerve damage? Sister Shu will recover? the male asked. Of course, the Cortai sniffed. She had me treating her. Regari sighed at the doctor's arrogance, but let him lead him over to another hoverbed to have his elbow examined. Ima crept over to Shu's bed, looking down at the deceptively fragile figure. The skin of her face was pale, paler than Ima had ever seen, and it made the bruising around Shu's eyes all the more lurid. Her forearm was in an anti-kinetic brace, preventing it from moving while the human's bones mended themselves, while the other was wrapped in regenerative bandages. Of all the injuries, Ima found herself concerned for Shu's arm, the bandages should prevent scarring, but she would worry until she could see for herself. She didn't want her friend to suffer permanent damage for having saved all of them. For all that Shu was giving and selfless, she could be surprisingly vain about her appearance, the way she'd worry about her head fur and skin, and the odd and funny treatments she devised for both had been the subject of good-natured teasing back at the commune. I'm a side, pressing some buttons on the wall which caused a chair to pop out and reconfigure itself to her anatomy. Sitting down, she prepared to wait. Her vigil remained undisturbed. Most of the worst injuries, the ones that didn't mean instant death, had already been treated, and the rest were minor things which didn't require a prolonged stay in the medical bay. The odd crew member would look over curiously at the lone human and her Gowan guard, but Ima would glare at them until they scurried off. Regari merely gave her a nod as he left the bay, his arm encased in its own brace. Apparently, Trog had judged the joint as salvageable. Ima nodded back in gratitude. The crew who wandered by to see the injured human, yes, humans could be hurt, angered Ima, but the sapience she didn't see angered her to the point of spitting. Where was Furfeg? Where was the Rich Plains captain? They owed their lives, the continued existence of their ship, to the human laying on the hoverbed beside her. They could at least check on her. Eventually, the events of the day and her anger wore the Gowan mother out, and she fell asleep in her chair, comforted by the presence of another female. Ima? The Gowan jerked awake. She blinked and looked over to find Shu's head turned toward her, her dark eyes glittering in the medical bay's lights. Ima stood, trying not to notice how the bruises around Shu's eyes had darkened. She reached a paw out and took hold of the human's hand. Oh, good. You're awake. Shu glanced around the bay with the hollow curiosity of complete exhaustion. We won? She rasped. 
It was on the tip of her muzzle to say, you won, but she knew better. Yes, we did. How many? She squeezed Shu's hand softly. Not that even her full strength would be noticeable to the human. Sixteen. But another two hundred are safe. Rest, Shu, and get better. She leaned in, speaking quietly. The physician is Kortai, but he's passed the vetting process required to work for Furfeg, and I'll be keeping an eye on him. Shu shifted her arms, her expression turning quizzical as she noticed the small humming units and its attached feeds on her arm. An infuser, Ima explained. It's providing moisture and nutrients to you until you are well enough to eat unaided. She hesitated, then forced some joviality into her voice. Really, Shu, the distances you'll go to avoid eating your nutrient spheres. Shu blinked slowly, then smiled. It seemed easier than getting them to cook my food properly. Well, you're turning my fur white before my time. Can't have that. Not if you're going to seduce Rigari. Her muzzle dropped open. Shu! She sputtered. Further proving the stars were out to get her, the subject of Shu's jibe chose that moment to walk in. Oh, good. You're both awake. Good morning. Morning? Ima glanced at the time displayed above Shu's hoverbed. Had she really slept half a day? Rigari came to a stop next to them. He ducked his head in greeting to both females, but particularly deeply to Shu. Sister Shu, I'm glad to see you awake. Her eyes looked at his arm, and he lifted it with a small wince of pain. Winged by a hunter pulse blast, he explained, almost sheepishly. The joint won't need to be replaced, although I must keep it immobilized for a couple of ten days at least. It could have been much worse. Ima shuddered in agreement. Worse when it came to hunters didn't necessarily mean dying. He hesitated. Related to that, Mother Ima, I must speak to you. She gestured, but he shook his head. No, alone, please. The slender strips of fur over Shu's eyes lifted, and Ima knew the human well enough to interpret the gesture. Don't start, she admonished, drawing a weak grin from Shu and a confused look from Rigari. Very well, Officer Rigari. We can speak in the corner there. As for you, she pointed to Shu, go to sleep. Yes, mother, Shu replied with a whine that could have come from Myun, though her lips were tilted to indicate humor. Her eyelids drooped obediently. Ima walked through the corridors of the ship, making friendly gestures to the crew she passed. They were all stressed and harried, and she had no desire to add to their burdens, so she hid the anger that seethed inside her, the desire to hiss and spit right there in the middle of the corridor. She knew if she started, she'd likely end up sedated in the medical bay next to Shu. She'd had to consult a shipboard map to find Furfeg's quarters. They were located near the greenhouse in the belly of the ship, the place a Governor Agavendragon would feel most comfortable. Well, he wouldn't feel comfortable for long if she had any say. When she approached the doors, she barely waited for them to slide open, plowing in without regard for protocol or politeness. Furfeg sat near a large table, his bulk resting on a bench. Stood nearby, likely giving the diplomat a report on the state of the rich plains. Both looked up as she entered, the captain's long, slender neck swinging around in surprise. Ah, Mother Ima, Furfeg began. I was just speaking to the captain about the disposition of the hunter ship. Get out, she told Excuse me, the uniformed Rikaturpcher replied, blinking at being ordered about on his own ship. You heard me. I will speak to Diplomat Furfeg, and I don't think he will want you here for it. Gave the huge diplomat an incredulous look, but Furfeg was watching Ima carefully. Eventually, the great shaggy head bobbed in assent. I think it best if I speak with her. Signal the Dominion fleet and have them deal with the derelict. I think it best it be towed back to Gao, but I'll leave it to your superiors to decide. I the captain paused. Very well. His long neck bowed briefly to Furfeg, and again to Ima. The large door whispered as he left. Furfeg waited until the door sealed before speaking again. Very well. Mother Ima, what can— Why did you change the transponder frequency? She demanded. His flanks turned a soft orange. Pardon? She stomped toward him, not caring that he was nearly three times her height. She pointed at the deck as if accusing it, and her claws peeked out of their sheaths. The transponder frequency for this ship was changed when we left Gao. 
changed at your orders. That's hardly unusual. Ships will change frequency depending on what sector they're in, to avoid conflict with other vessels. It's purely routine. Except the frequency you changed it to is one that has been shown to have a correlation with hunter attacks over the last two standard years. There are travel advisories warning against using it. The hunters found us because we were waving a flag at them. Why? Mother Ima, I understand that you are quite upset, and understandably. Your friend lies injured. My sister lies injured, she snapped. Injured saving all of us, including you. Her voice became a growl as she snarled and spit. You've been involved with Gowans for nearly thirty standard years. You know what will happen if I decide you have had any hand in those injuries, directly or not. He watched her carefully. His flanks had turned a pale gray. She is not Gowan, he said. She was not born on Gao, but she is my sister. There it is, he surged to his feet, his bench nearly toppling. His bulk loomed over her, and she was suddenly intensely aware of how small she was. His wide-set eyes blazed, and he pointed at her with a shaggy arm. His flanks glowed a bright blue, jubilant. That is what I need, Mother Ima. That is what we'll all need. Ima took a timid step back. Wh what The big herbivore began to pace his quarters. Do you ever wonder how a species like the humans could have ever survived long enough to become sapient? What? What does that have to do with- Furfeg rolled on as if she hadn't even spoken. They are ferociously competitive. They are hardly the first competitive species to arise in the galaxy, not even the first omnivores. But most species with such a mindset are either swarms, like the hunters, or solitary in nature, like the Cortai. The easiest way to deal with competitors is either to destroy them or avoid them. The humans have done neither, at least not deliberately. Why do you think this is? I... They are neither herd animals nor solitary. They are small groups sociable. A human cannot stand to be alone, nor can they stand to be a nameless face in the crowd. They need to be surrounded by faces they know, by beings they care about, and who care about them. They need family. The secret to their success is their families, and the fact that there is nothing they will not do for the sake of their family. And you, Mother Ima, have made this discovery purely by accident. Furfeg was pacing his office, gesturing broadly. Ima stood as still as possible. Governor Agavendragon were herd animals, and a panicked herd animal was dangerous, no matter how civilized. Ima could tell that Furfeg was treading the edge. What do you mean? She asked carefully, voice artificially calm. You found a human, and you adopted her. She is cut off from her species, her world. But your presence, your acceptance, salves the wound. This fear of the humans, we snatch them from their world. They're experimented upon, then tossed aside, alone, and kept that way. And we wonder why so many act badly, for Shu, her loyalty, this need for family and friendship, is transferred to you and your clan. There is nothing she would not do for her family. We've seen that. She didn't like how cynical and exploitative he made that sound. The Gowan people are no different. We stand with our clans. Exactly. Exactly! Your people are unique in the galaxy to understand the humans. And that understanding may save us all. Furfeg, you're not making any sense. He halted his pacing, and his flanks rippled with gray, dark blue with spots of white and green. Resignation, misery, and fear. My people have made a mistake, Mother Ima. A terrible mistake, and I don't think they've even realized it. Counselor Vedrig suspects, perhaps, but even he was unable to prevent it from happening. Ima completely agreed, but it was clear that there was more to it. What kind of mistake? She asked carefully. Furfeg paused, visibly putting his words together. If one of my people was taken by the Kortai, we would regret the loss, but be more concerned with the safety of our people as a whole. We would not pursue the matter in the interests of protecting our people in total. The Kortai themselves hardly care if one of their own is kidnapped or killed. Two different approaches, but the same end result. Ima bobbed her head to show her understanding. Now... What would happen if I were to threaten you in front of your commune, or Officer Regari in front of his clan? 
She hesitated. You would likely regret it. Exactly. If you were alone, you would simply avoid or escape the situation. A threat to your people is too abstract. But if someone were to threaten you or your sisters in view of the others, you would act. You will defend your clan, your families. And like in so very many things, the humans have the same traits, taken to the extreme. He halted, and his sides flushed dark blue spotted with white, like stars in an evening sky. The translator gave his voice a quake when he spoke again. My people have imprisoned seven billion humans, and almost every single one of those humans has family they care about. Suddenly, Furfeg's near panic was quite understandable. Then, why the transponder, Furfeg? He gestured helplessly. Shu was the perfect human to plead their case before the council, Mother Ima. She is quiet, friendly, calm, but not cold, open to new ideas as shown by her adaptation to your society. She is not threatening, as so many humans seem to be. But I needed more. More? What more? I needed a hero. I, I swear to you, I did not expect so massive a hunter response. The human encountered by Counselor Akaten Ziktik Jenkins easily dealt with the crew of a standard hunter pack ship. I thought, I thought to recreate the situation. Let Shu prove herself a hero. Let her prove her loyalty to you. Restraint is easier to respect when you can glimpse the power behind it. Ima found herself following his logic. It made sense in a weird, distorted way. And now sixteen of the crew are dead. You nearly killed us all. I'm trying to save us all! He roared. She couldn't keep up with the colors cycling along his sides. The humans are going to get loose, Mother Ima. Escape is impossible, but to a human the impossible is merely an inconvenience. And when they do, they'll want revenge. Revenge for all the families we threatened. A great shaggy arm pointed at her. We have to bring that shield down before their anger grows too concentrated. And when they emerge, the only way to defeat them will be the way Gao did. Not with fire, but with friendship. She stared at him, words eluding her. He dropped his arm but said no more, his sides heaving as he breathed heavily. I understand your motivation, Furfeg, she said carefully. But this, this is not the way. Being human does not mean she is immune to fear. What if she had stayed in our quarters exactly as I had advised? Then we would have been lost, but merely sooner rather than later, he replied his flanks the color of misery and resignation. The humans have many wise sayings, Mother Ima. One is, courage is resistance to fear, mastery of fear, not absence of fear. Another is, heroes are not born, they are made. I needed to make a hero. She sighed. And so you have. Her ears tilted in regret, realizing she was implicitly going along with his plan. His chromatic strips turned purple with sincere gratitude. Thank you, he said. His voice was still somber as he continued. We will need to guide this correctly, to put her actions in their best, proper light. The Gowans on board won't be an issue, but... He halted as his data tablet chimed with an incoming call. Grumbling, he walked over to tap it. Yes? Ambassador Furfeg, this is the captain. I gathered that. What is it, your urgent... I'm in the middle of an important discussion. This is more important, Ambassador, the captain responded sharply, and Ima's ears flicked in surprise at the tone. We've received a message. General broadcast. Sent via the emergency notification system. The emergent- What is the message? Message is as follows. Ultimatum from hunters. Demand all humans be turned over else, quote, swarm of swarms, end quote, will raid known human locations. The captain hesitated. All ships- Stations, carrying human passengers, advised. Jettison immediately. The message ends there. What? Ima snarled. Ambassador, what are your instructions? Ambassador. Furfeg stabbed his tablet with a huge furry finger. His legs wobbled, and he slumped down onto his bench. We're doomed, he said hollowly. Even if we bring down the shield, it'll look to the humans like we're just saving our own skins and feeding them to the swarm. And if we don't... We're doomed. I'm a spit. No, Furfeg. We're saved. Stand up. You wanted heroes. Now you have seven billion of them. It's time to give them their chance. 
We, we can't possibly go to the council now, Ima. I'm not even certain I can keep Shu safe on this ship, she hesitated. Then we'll leave, she replied finally. To where? Back to Gao? She shook her head. No, I don't think Shu would even allow it once she learns of this. We'll figure it out. Forgive me, but I think it best you don't know. He nodded. I understand. I'll have the captain's yacht loaded with as many nutrition spheres as it can hold, as well as medical supplies. The captain's yacht? Ima said, surprised. It was a large shuttle down in the landing bay, normally intended for ferrying dignitaries. It was comfortable and long-range. Ideal for their purposes, but... Are you allowed to give that to us? Furfeg's flanks flushed red. The Dominion can bill me. All right, everyone, that is going to do it for this uh, second part of the Ox's plan. Next, we will be moving back on to Salvage, where Adrian will be blowing some shit up and possibly powering the Zodrasil up for the first time. So that's going to be fun. Thank you guys so much for listening. I really appreciate you spending your time here with me, and I can't wait to see you in the next one. Thanks, guys.